a couple of things about the first reading before I talk about the gospel. One is um, that here uh, we see this also reflected in the psalm that St. Paul is saying we can see, we can know God through nature. We can come to recognize his presence in his creative work. Um, there was a, a famous uh, apologist or someone who defended the faith that before he was an apologist, he was a communist and an atheist. And one morning uh, at breakfast, he saw his daughter's ear and was looking at the intricacy of the uh, turnings and everything in the ear. And he said, that can't just be by chance. And it was a conversion moment for him because he saw the intelligent design in the ear and how it allowed then the sound to get in there. And for him, that was a conversion moment as he recognized God's presence in nature. Now, for those of you who are having trouble hearing, that might not be such a great uh, design or whatever. You might be saying, oh, what's wrong with this? Oh, that's part of the fall. But we recognize that God is present in nature and we can see his incredible design just looking at a leaf or the way an ant works or in, in all of nature looking at our human bodies. The second piece I want to touch about, he says, talking about the wrath of God and everything, therefore God handed them over to their impurity through the lusts of their hearts, the mutual degradation of their bodies, that God's punishment isn't to say, okay, now I'm going to show, uh, throw fire and brimstone, brimstone down from the sky. But rather, I'm going to let you go and do what you want to do. If that's what you want. If you would rather that than me, have at it. Because that's its own punishment. Bishop Sheen said at one point, he says, I can imagine, for instance, a hell where gamblers have to play cards for the rest of eternity. And then he said to the crew, he says, if you, if you don't get that, you know, ask me on the way out. But he, he said that our, our, our sin is a punishment in and of itself because it leaves us empty and dry. And so he says, okay, you want this? It's its own punishment. Yeah, it'll, it'll titillate for a moment, but it'll leave you empty. It says, come back to me, and there I will give you my life. So those are about the... There's plenty that I could go through through Romans. There's, please, read it again. Delve into it. Pray with it. It's incredible. But um, the Gospel today, what struck me just about this whole idea of purity. The, the ritual purity laws, specifically in the time of Jesus, was, were built on, of course, a, an expansion of the ritual purity laws that we see in like Leviticus and in the Old Testament. Um, and I was reading a commentary about Leviticus and it was talking about the difference between purity and uh, something that's purified and something that's sanctified. And this was all important for how they were living within the community in the desert surrounding the ark with the fire that came down from heaven and, or, or the, cloud, the Shekinah cloud during the day. That they were in the presence of Almighty God. And so the cleanliness code was something was clean if it was able to be in the presence of God. And something is sanctified when they would sanctify it, it didn't just, wasn't just something that could be in the presence of God, it rather bore in some way the presence of God. And so to be sanctified is to bear Christ's presence. To be purified means to be able to be in Christ's presence. Now, something that's unclean can't be sanctified, has to be purified before it can be sanctified. So you follow this cycle that it goes um, unclean, clean, sanctified, clean, unclean, so it can, that's, that's how it works. Um, and so when we look at this, the people of Israel, as they were surrounding, the, as they were in the camp in the desert, they were always in the presence of Almighty God. And so they had to be clean. 
They had to be sanctified. And if, if they were unclean because of leprosy or some other thing on the outside, they had to leave the camp. And so this was a symbol of saying, okay, look at what's going on and you have to be doing something in order to be in my presence. Now, of course, this then went into the Levitical code for the Levitical priests so that after they had created their temple, now the priests, as they were working in the temple, they had to be purified in order to be enter into the presence of Almighty God. But that wasn't necessarily something that everyone in Israel, if they were living in the Galilee area, you know, uh, however many miles away that is, 70 miles or whatever, um, they didn't have to necessarily follow all the ritual purity laws. And so in the time of Jesus, we have the Pharisees who are saying, well, no, we have to be clean all the time, which nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But now they're judging others for not doing all these ritual purity laws. But the point of the ritual purity law was to show I am doing something to remind myself that I need to be in, that I'm coming into the presence of God. So I need to be clean of sin in order to come to the presence of God, in order to allow his presence to enter me. Now, bring this to our day today. Jesus is saying, don't just do the outside, do the inside. And don't just be clean. Be sanctified. Why? When we receive communion, we bear the presence of God. By our baptism, the Holy Spirit lives within us. We bear the presence of God. And so he's inviting us not just to look at the outside and the things we do, but rather, have I allowed God to cleanse my heart, to purify me on the inside? So that I not only can be in God's presence, but I can bear God's presence.